in your coaching, uh, where do you get your background from coaching? Uh, you, uh, reading some way, working with other trainers, just a mix Spe of Specifically, if you're talking about the specific athletic part of it, this, some of it's from my boxing years. <clears throat> I had a lot of good coaches. One when I first moved here, I boxed here in Portland for a little bit when I was younger. Jesse Sandoval, who passed away, he was about 89 when I trained with him, and he boxed back in the, like the 20s or whatever. And so I learned a lot of stuff from those guys about dealing with athletes, and, and you're talking issues there, you're talking about enhancing performance and explaining to an athlete so the terms that they can understand what exactly they need to do to get better, <clears throat> and motivation, being able to motivate people. That's all part of coaching. I haven't learned much as, as far as teaching from martial arts people. Most of what I've seen them do, I've thrown away. One of the things I like to dispel right away is the idea that there is a uh, difference between being a good technician and being a good fighter. And there's a myth out there that you can be a good technician. There's some people that are good technicians, but they're not good fighters. And there's some people that are good fighters, and they're not good technicians. I'll tell you right now, it's true that some people can fight without technique because they're just big and they have real high pain tolerance. It is not true that uh, there are people that have good technique, but they can't fight. I mean, that's an oxymoron. If, you have, if you're a good technician and you can't fight, wh where's the technique at? What are you good at? It doesn't make any sense, see? So in order to be a good technician and be a good, eh, you have to be a good fighter. The two go hand in hand. There's no such thing as a good technician without being a good fighter. If you're going to be a good technician in stand-up fighting, and you're a good fighter, you can spar well. And that's all it means. It doesn't mean you hit focus mitts well. It doesn't mean your form looks good on the focus mitts or the tie pads. That means nothing if uh, once a guy starts throwing blows at you, you crumble and fall apart. And then all of it, all it is is just for show, and you're a focus mitt hero, okay? All right, now we're going to go into a little bit of sparring. And one of the things I want to talk about is, like I said in the intro of the tape, you can't be a good technician unless you can also fight. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, if you're a good technician, uh, then sometimes you can out-technique even a bigger opponent uh, than you. Someone that uh, outweighs you by a lot, you still might have a chance, even in sports like boxing and wrestling. A lot of people think boxing and wrestling is all size and strength. It's not. But anytime you have two athletes who know the same thing, size and strength is going to become very important. It's the same in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. If you have two Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guys and they both know the same stuff, and they're both at the same skill level, heavyweight's going to have a big advantage. That's why there's weight classes in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Any fight, weight, and size counts. And anybody that tells you the strength, size, and weight doesn't count in anything having to do with fighting or combat sports or street fighting uh, is a fool, okay, because it really does. But that doesn't mean if you're a small person that you just quit and, and, and don't and give up. You just have to work much, much harder than a bigger guy, and you have to use what you have, which is going to be speed and movement, uh, footwork, and uh, you're going to have to out-technique them, out-hustle them, and you better be in better shape than they are. Because when they get tired, that's pretty much your only chance. And if you're going to get tired before a big guy, then you're going to be in a lot of trouble. We have a real philosophy that goes through all the gyms. Matt's modeled that very well. And that is very much that we're coaches and that we're working and we're athletes. And so very much Matt is in his exploration with his game and developing. We've seen that. We model that. And so we bring that to our students. I, I kind of make a joke, and that is whenever students in my class ask questions, I say, you know, critical thinking really isn't encouraged here, which is really just the opposite. We really encourage that. And so you do. And, the, and everyone knows at our gym that we're going to take risks, we're going to do stuff, and because it's alive, we might show something, we might work it, and then we'll refine it. We come back and say, hey, we need to add to this. But it is. It's very alive, and we always go out there and kind of say, this is what we're working on now. We're working on it with you. Let's go together. And it, it keeps us very honest because you always have to keep training at the gym. Uh, it would be very easy and comfortable to sit back and just kind of coach off to the side, but I think you get very disassociated with the material, with the curriculum. By us being in it, we understand and we have to be very much a part of it. And our learning curve is right there with the students. We are, you know, because we train so much, hopefully we're ahead of the students, but we're, we're making mistakes live and we're fixing them live and they see that and that helps them become better problem solvers too. And you don't feel any kind of problem with, with the students not looking up to, to the instructors in the gym when, when they see us making mistakes and then correct them as we go, or if, if a student actually wakes an instructor tap. That would be the kind of student that probably would be hanging out the straight blast gym anyway. I mean, we talk about that. Our motto is tough isn't how you act, tough is how you train. We, we're not big into uniforms and sashes and all that kind of stuff. We're really, we're training to be functional. And if you're going to train live, if you're going to make it functional, you got to get out there and do it. And so in doing it, you're going to make mistakes. And so, again, I think that's a reaffirming thing. It's the students go, yeah, hey, 
this will work and yeah, I can mess up too. So I have to be very aware of kind of my checklist, how I'm going to train. And we model that. And so we're very comfortable with it. And again, I've yet to see people who train at the gym. Um, they actually respect that. They dig that, that idea of coaching, that we're a workshop that, you know, or, or a laboratory and we're there working material. The philosophy of your gym is different from most. What is the philosophy of the gym? And more specifically, the principles. Okay. Well, I have five, we have five core principles that we teach at the gym. And the, the curriculum at the gym and what we do at the gym is based around those five principles. And the first one is aliveness. Um, and the basic premise that I work of off of, and it's a simple one, is that for anything to have any intrinsic value, it has to, first of all, be true. If it's not true, it doesn't have any value. Now, what we do, and what I do, in my job, when I'm at the office, that means it has to work against another human being, against a resisting opponent. It has to work in a fight. Otherwise, I don't think it has any value. So as a consequence, a lot of the Asian martial arts and the more mystical aspects of martial arts that, uh, that are essentially bullshit, and that don't work in a fight, and, uh, and that won't work against a resisting opponent, people still sometimes tend to train them under the excuse or auspices of uh, spiritual development or um, the tradition makes them a better person, and I really think that that's uh, a pseudo-philosophy. It's false, because if it's not true, if what they're doing doesn't work in a physical sense, then I don't think it's going to have any value as far as building character or morality or reaching a higher spiritual plane or any of that stuff. So that's the principle I work off of. And, that, and the way I try and teach people how to determine what it will work and what will not work is by teaching the principle of aliveness. Because once somebody has figured out what aliveness really means, and a lot of people think they know it, but you, you can tell by the way they train that they have no idea. But once somebody really does grasp that concept internally and they understand it, they're never going to be able to be fooled again. And they're never going to have some uh, martial arts con man come in and teach them some goofy move and think it'll work. I mean, they'll, for the rest of their life, they'll be able to do whatever they want to do, but nobody's going to be able to con them regarding martial arts because they understand aliveness. And that's why I try and teach that principle. It's a guiding, it's like a, um, uh, beacon. a beacon, yeah, a guiding light or uh, something that shows you which path you should take. If you're always doing training with aliveness and what you're doing is alive and you're working with timing, motion, and a resisting opponent and you're doing those three things, it's alive, then you're always going to be on the path to self-improvement. So that's why that's the number one principle. If we start to do something that's a dead pattern, it's not alive, everything else falls out of place. So that aliveness is always the number one thing. So really it's just a process. It's an evolution of finding something that works and studying that. If you could find something that would counter the clinch or, or boxing at work that you could pull off the sparring, you apply to that. I would. Absolutely. Do I think that's out there? No. It's a Tom on the interview that we did here earlier, I remember he had a real good saying that I liked a lot, Tom over here. He said that part for the curriculum we have now, he thinks we have the width that we need. Now it's just going to be depth, which I think is true. I don't think that you're ever I'm ever going to figure out something else on the ground. I think I'm I'm pretty well versed in the, on the ground, and I don't think I'm going to run into somebody that's going to show me a move that I probably haven't seen before. It's going to be a variation, you know, because all, all fighters, myself included, have variations of sweeps and arm bars and stuff that we do. But I know every way there is to know to break somebody's joint. And there's not going to be some Martian that's going to come down from Venus that's going to teach me another way, you know what I mean? I've been exposed to it. When it comes to wrestling, those guys have been doing that for 400 years, you know what I mean? They know all the ways there is to take a human body down to the mat. So there's nobody that's going to come around and show them another way to do it. So I'm skeptical that we're going to find anything better in the clinch than what we're doing now in Greco and freestyle. I'm skeptical you're ever going to find anything that works for stand-up better than Western boxing. Yeah, but that doesn't mean we can't get better and that our depth and understanding of those things grow all the time. My understanding of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu grows every day. My game will change on a daily basis and sometimes I'll wake up two months for no reason my skill is just way better and I hit a growth spurt, and I understand things more. And when you understand things more, it means, in my mind, it means it's simpler for me, not more detailed. And the more I learn, and the simpler it gets. You, you, know, you understand what I'm saying? So that's the depth, but we're not going to be adding a bunch of new arts to it. I, I'm skeptical that that would happen. <clears throat>